Hello and welcome. Welcome to Ulta Live. This is the digital event series we do here at the Journal of Alta California. I am so happy to welcome you all here for today's discussion with naturalist and artist Robin Lee Carlson on her new book, The Cold Canyon Fire Journals. My name is Beth Spotswood and I'm Alta's digital editor. Today, we're going to talk with Robin, a natural science writer and illustrator with degrees in evolutionary biology from UC Santa Cruz and the University of Chicago. This new book, the Cold Canyon Fire Journals, Green Shoots and Silver Linings in the Ashes was just released on August 2nd, um, and it's published by our friends at Heyday Books in Berkeley. I want to give them a shout out. We love you at Heyday. Before we begin our conversation with Robin, some brief housekeeping. Alta Live is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. In fact, in addition to the magazine, we've got a website that features things like a monthly roundup of the new releases you should read. August includes the Cold Canyon Fire Journals. You can join us for a member for as little as $3 a month and support the work we do, including our monthly California book club. In fact, tomorrow night, we welcome Robbie Almadine with special guests Susan Sarandon and Rebecca Mackay. That's tomorrow night at five. We'll send you an invite to that. Um, the California Book Club, our newsletters, our weekend reads, they're all free to join, as is this event, um, the Alta Live series we do every Wednesday. There is a Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen. Please ask questions of Robin. We'll chat for about 30 minutes and then get to as many of those questions as we can. This interview will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later today. We've received a number of emails asking about that. Don't worry, this will be recorded. And in fact, if you're registered for this event, we will email you um, a link to this interview, as well as links to Robin's work, where you can buy the book, where you can read more about wildfires on altaonline.com, um, an array of other things. So eyes peeled for that later this afternoon. Um, with that, it is so good to be here. Um, I love to see where everyone is. So please chime in in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. Hi, Pendleton, Oregon. Um, I am in Novato, California. Robin, where are you? Hi, where are you today? Hi, I am in Davis, California. Um, Davis, as we learn, is pretty close to the Cold Canyon. Um, there's, they, you're, you kind of, found yourself prior to the rag fire. Hi, Mill Valley, Virginia, Santa Cruz, Richmond. Hi, everyone. Um, you, you really were in a unique position having loved Cold Canyon for so, so long. And you'd been documenting it um, as an artist and a, a journalist is just a kind of a scientist and a woman interested in love with nature for so long. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with this very specific nook of California before 2015, leading up to 2015? Yeah, absolutely. So it is this really sort of wonderful <laughs> gem um, that's, you know, it's only about 25 minutes from Davis. Um, and it is part of the University of California Natural Reserve System, but is a fairly unique part of that system because it is open to the public. A lot of the reserves are closed so that scientific research can happen sort of unimpeded, but this one is open to the public. And so there's research, but it's also open to hikers. And um, it being so close, it's a beautiful place to hike. And so I had been hiking there since I was a kid. and um, it was definitely a casual relationship with it that I had before I started doing this, this study about fire, um, you know, a very much more recreational relationship, but it had always felt like a place of learning to me because um, I went on a field trip there with my ninth grade class. And so it was where I learned about, a, you know, a bunch of things about California ecology for the first time. And so it, it just, it felt like this wonderful place to go and just enjoy being out in nature. But I did always have this association with sort of changing my perspectives and learning new things about ecology there. And so you you talk about in the book, you had spotted the 2015, there was this fire and you, from the distance, you had seen the smoke. Um, and as a Californian, I, I, you know, we all know instantly what that is. The rag fire was started by car exhaust. Um, human, I guess, impact, we're calling it. 
Um, and it, how, how did you, this place that you had loved, and I know that you speak about this in the book, but for those that haven't yet read it, um, what was that? You, you were worried. I mean, you were terrified that this kind of beloved sacred space was being burned in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, we see smoke all the time, all of us Californians uh, in the summer and think, oh, it's a fire. I wonder where it is. I, you know, and then when I heard the next day or so that um, that this reserve had burned as part of this fire, absolutely. My first response was, oh, no, this is so horrible. You know, this is this beautiful place. So many people love it. What a huge tragedy, which is, you know, was generally my reaction to any fire. Um, of course, in an abstract way, any fire anywhere, but certainly the ones that I had some familiarity with, um, you know, when Point Reyes burned or Mount Diablo burned, the similar reaction of, oh my goodness, these places that I love, you know, they're they're gone. I know they won't be gone forever, but it, you know, it, it this is a devastating thing. Um, but you kind of happen to be in this unique position of having drawn and taken notes on this specific region this while touched by humans certainly is not like in 2018 so much of inhabited santa rosa burned this was a fire where there was no loss of life only a handful of structures were destroyed you were in this unique position to especially with the um you see nature what was it called like remind me i have a link to it ready to go natural reserves yeah. the natural reserves you had kind of this opportunity to study what happened after the fire and you really took advantage of it and that's kind of the the heart of this book is we kind of see this canyon reemerge am i even gonna let we you talk about the word reemerge or merge anew um following the fire and there are, it's it happens very slowly and in kind of unexpected ways with um animals that are you talk about the animals that are drawn to fire um newts walking into the fire the beetles and all of that can you talk a little bit about where we are in california as i mean i, I guess as you've learned as a naturalist in studying the cold canyon um where we are in terms of california climate change wildfires um and then kind of the impact of humans that are all there's this intersection and it's all kind of coming together yeah, so what was really interesting about the first fire that happened there um, during this time that I've been paying attention. Um, so in 2015, it had been 30 years since the reserve had burned before. Um, and the habitats at the reserve are primarily oak woodland and chaparral. And so a fairly healthy fire regime for chaparral really is probably greater than 30 years, but 30 years is probably the very lowest limit of, of a relatively healthy interval in between fires. And so that fire in 2015 felt like, a, you know, an opportunity to see the these habitats respond in the way that they had pretty much evolved to do, that this was a fairly healthy time for the reserve to have burned, and the responses of, of everything that lived there were probably going to be fairly similar to the way that they historically responded to fire in California. Um, with that though, there already, I mean, we've been on a drought trajectory <laughs> with, with a few breaks here and there in California for quite a while. And so even then there were things impacting the recovery from this fire um, that, that are new for these species, um, definitely because of drought and, and higher temperatures. Um, but then where, where the climate change and, and human impacts really came in is that then this reserve burned again after five years um, and burned again in 2020 um, as in, in part of these larger lightning complex fires um, throughout the state. And so five years is very much not <laughs> enough time for Chaparral to respond in the way that it evolved to do. Not, not a healthy time. interval in between. Wildfires. Not right, likely not a healthy interval. Um, and as we're learning, it sounds like it's not only the distance between fires, it's also how many times a place has burned over a larger period, like over the last hundred years. And three burns, which is what Cold Canyon has had now, may also sort of be a tipping point, um, even independently of how far apart those were. So now it's only been since 2020, so I haven't been observing it for that long, but it is likely that there will be more habitat type shifts there, um, thanks to drought, heat, other climate change, um, frequency of fire 
um, that will be showing up there that might not have had it just had this one burn in 2015. And what does that mean for the rest of us who aren't regular, you know, Colt Canyon enthusiasts? What, for me in Nevada, what is that? How does that impact me? Yeah, so it, I think it, it gives, it gives us a, a bunch of different sort of windows into, into what's happening because even though we have this overall pattern of climate change influencing fire and potentially happen, making it happen more frequently. The thing that I, the most important thing that I've learned from all of this is fire is very important. Fire can be very destructive, but it's also an absolutely critical part of these ecosystems. And even if we're seeing less healthy fire patterns, it doesn't mean that the impacts of the fires are always all bad. I mean, even this fire that occurred pretty quickly after the last one, there are lots of things, lots of positive impacts that that fire is still having in that ecosystem. And it doesn't mean that it has wiped out all the habitats there all at once. It means that there is almost certainly a, a slow shift happening in the habitats. And that might be a way from, you know, we don't want things to change from the way that we find them beautiful now, but it, doesn't change the fact that, you know, nature continues there and many of the species that were there are still there and are going to respond to this fire in a fairly normal way. And that there are some species that probably are, you know, that benefited from that since there are so many species that are, are quite happy to burn and, you know, are still getting a lot of benefit out of, out of these fires. Well, you talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Robin one more question, and then I'm going to share some of her work with you. And then I'm going to ask her to read, and then we're going to take your questions. So there's a little rundown of what's about to happen. Um, Robin, you talk in the book about how humans need to foster a better relationship with fire. And in fact, you refer to it as a partnership when referring to the kind of indigenous Californians, you talk about their partnership that they had with fire. What is are having a better relationship with fire look like? I think the, the first and most important thing is understanding that fire is meant to be here. Fire needs to happen. It's something that we, <laughs> we can try to exclude from, from the world around us as much as we want, but we aren't going to. Um, it's here and understanding that it does so many important things in the natural world in all of these habitats that evolved with fire it does so many things that we aren't even aware of to keep those habitats healthy that we that now have been trying to do on our own through restoration projects that we will never do in the way that fire has so understanding that we have to live with fire and we can do that in a positive way or a negative way and if we do understand that fire helps us accomplish a lot of things that we think are valuable in the natural world and does it in a much better and more complete way than we're able to do it um, understanding that then if we if we do let fire do what it's meant to do that will help later it will help it with preventing fire from doing the things we don't want it to do we absolutely can see now with some of these very large fires when they burn across areas that have had more um more of a partnership relationship with fire like in yosemite national park we see fires outside the park burn in a much more destructive manner than they burn inside the park because we've had that partnership with fire in the park and it absolutely makes a difference for future fires so that that's definitely where I think we should all start. And when you talk about a partnership with fire, you're referencing controlled burns. Yeah, so it's both um, it, us introducing fire um, to, you know, through controlled burns, um, through the kind of burning that was done by indigenous people. Um, it also means letting fires that are not immediately going to destroy human habitation, and human lives, um, letting those burn too. So some of it is just letting fire be in a, in a more passive way as well even fires that were started by accidents or arson? If they're in areas where they're not threatening anything, and yes, absolutely, it doesn't really necessarily matter how they started. And it's just, they they are important to have out there on the landscape. And of course, I mean, that does come with the caveat that as things get hotter and drier, that, I mean, the way that letting fires burn used to work in the past is they would burn, but then there would be natural conditions that would eventually make them go out. And of course that, that how that happens is changing. So there are caveats to it, but again, we're, we're seeing the evidence in places of, of how this still helps. I want to share some of your work. This is from Robin's website. Um, can you talk about, let me just pause. Um, how, why, 
do you can you talk a little bit about um the way that you chronicle nature and your studies um with illustration what are the tools that you use why is it important um for you to kind of draw as opposed to take pictures i mean I, of course you're an artist but um can you just talk a little bit about the kind of the very personal connection you have with um and the book is very personal too you talk about your family and your childhood and your hikes and your drives um and and the art really builds upon that um can you talk about your artwork here yeah so it, sort of two things um just when when one is and when I am drawing something, it forces me to stop and be much more present in that moment and in that place than I would be any other way, um, because I am paying much more close attention when I'm trying to figure out how to represent what I'm seeing on the page rather than just sort of looking and thinking about what I'm seeing. So it really makes me much more present there. And then I think that it also helps me to um, then record on the page um, a whole lot more of the the emotion and the feeling that I have when I'm there too so that I can remember what it was like to be there later and then also so that I can share that I think that sharing artwork with other people seeing things that have come from someone else's own hand <laughs> I think really increases that personal connection and I since I think that one of the most important things is for for all of us to have a deeper and more personal connection which, with what is happening in the world around us because of climate change and have, you know, be willing and open to have this more personal relationship with fire. I think that the, you know, artwork and drawing that was done on site while things were happening can help create this much more personal connection, I think, than any other way that I know how to do. Um, you, you've actually studied and, and brought your art tools out to controlled burns and and studied real fires how close do you get what's do you are you sitting there with paint as a fire or wildfire rages in front of you so yeah so it, i have had i've been to two different um very two different very different kinds of um controlled burning events and um and it's been two very different experiences of fire that way too the first one that i did was up as a part of a, a fairly large program sponsored by the nature conservancy and done in cooperation with state and federal government agencies, and then also with the Karuk tribe. Um, and this was a much larger training event for um, for wildland firefighters to do controlled burns. And so we were observing, we were not that far from the fire, but it was still a much more, we had all sorts of personal protective equipment and we were being very removed and safe um, in doing those drawings. And then I participated in a much, much more small community event with also with smaller scale burning being done at the Cache Creek Conservancy near, very near Davis, um, as they do um, smaller controlled burning and attending and gathering garden there. Um, and there, it, there were people of all ages, you know, sort of tending the fires and walking very close to the flames. And so it was a really great way to get up close and personal, again, with a very small, much smaller, um, these are not large raging wildfire type things, but much smaller, much calmer um, burning situations, but really a chance to get up close and even to see things like the lizard that emerges from the base of the grass, the top of the grass is just completely burned, but it's still cool and, and, um, and safe enough at the bottom that there was a lizard just happily sitting there while the rest of the grass burned. Um, would you be so kind as to read a bit from the Cold Canyon Fire Journals for us? I would love to. Uh, so this is from the um, ending of the introduction to the book. If we are to comprehend the global climate crisis, it is more essential than ever to be rooted in a place. I started studying Cold Canyon to more fully understand what is happening in my own backyard, knowing that this was the first step toward adapting to the new realities of our rapidly changing world. As I deepened my connection to my local landscape, links between the different parts of the ecosystem were revealed, opening my eyes to worlds I had not previously imagined. These worlds sometimes felt suddenly illuminated, much as the fire tearing through the canyon burned away the vegetation and peeled back layer after layer of the landscape, leaving behind the land's bare skeleton. During my first visits after the fire, I felt as though I had X-ray vision as I peered into the wide open vistas of exposed earth and denuded branches. It was a revelatory glimpse into what had been there all along, the shapes of the rocks and hills, the patterns of trees, and the paths of the tiny tributaries to Cold Creek etched into the slopes. 
My perspective shifted again and again as I developed a new appreciation for what constitutes a rich and healthy life. Just as a chaparral shrub is transformed by fire, looking dead to human eyes, but actually still fully alive, I have come to see that things that look like loss are actually hope. Looking at the charred canyon and slopes from the perspective of a flower, insect, or bird, I see that this is not a wasteland, but a landscape brimming with potential. My hope is not absolute. Climate change and suburban development are kindling an acceleration of fire cycles and fire intensity, which has critical implications for biodiversity and resilience. But when fire comes at healthy intervals, far from being an unnatural cataclysm, it is an essential part of Western habitat's normal life. That normal life is change, continuous change, and fire should fit seamlessly into the pattern. The damage and destruction of fire are essential for the vigorous flowering to come. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you. I want to get to audience questions. I want to start with one of my own. Um, if fire should fit seamlessly into um, our life, our cycles, um, these patterns, what does that mean for a state like California where um, that urban wildlife interface is um, growing constantly? We're all getting closer to wildfires. And we're a state with a um, housing crisis where we constantly, you know, there's so much discussion on wanting to build more. Um, what is what is your take on that? What does that mean for wildfires? Yeah, well, it's a bunch of different things. I mean, it's absolutely true that, you know, increasing <laughs> building in that wild, wildland urban interface in, increases both how much we have to put into fighting wildfires we can't let them burn when they're threatening homes um it also can increase the the you know the actual intensity and spread of the fires because once they get into human habitation our houses help spread fire faster too um and so in that aspect we know a lot now about building better and maintaining houses better so that they are much more fire resistant and cause less of a problem so there's absolutely being wise about where homes are built, built is critical. Being wise about how homes that are in any, under any threat ever from wildfire is critical. And then of course we could be, I mean, addressing the need for housing can absolutely mean building more densely in places that are not, not going to be as, as, as threatened and as much of a problem for wildfire. So I think all of those are things that we, I mean, we know, we know what we need to do. We just need to actually do it in this state. Carol asks, what species of wildlife benefit from wildfires? Yeah, so so there are there are a ton. I'll give some examples, and then I think there are many more out there that we haven't even figured out yet, too. Um, but uh, one of the exciting things to see after a wildfire are all of the um, wildflowers that come up in huge numbers in the burned areas because they have this opportunity after a fire to have access to all of the sunlight that might ordinarily be shaded out in a much more mature ecosystem. Um, they also have access probably to more water at that point too, because the larger trees and shrubs are either have either been killed or have just been much reduced in size, so they're not sucking up as much water. So there's all these resources available to the wildflowers um, that that this is their perfect time to grow. They grow in much greater numbers after fire than at any other time. So that they love it right after fire. And there are some wildflowers that only um, come up after fire. There's one called Whispering Bells in Cold Canyon that I was excited to see after the fire. You don't you see it for a few years after a fire and then it disappears again until another fire. Um, and so then that means that the particular, uh, for example, bees that are attracted to these wildflowers are much more excited right after a fire. There are some beetles and some wasps that like to lay eggs in burned um, in burned wood because the trees defenses have been <laughs> reduced or gotten rid of and so their larvae can grow up in these trees better so they go right to burning areas so that they can lay eggs. Um, and then my last example for right now woodpeckers love a lot of woodpecker species love um, love fires because of all of these insects that come right after the fire there's all this great food for the woodpeckers and then also um, great nesting opportunities for some species of woodpecker in the burned trees it opens up lots of cavities in the trees for them to nest in how is it possible for a flower to only bloom after a wildfire what plants the seed so yeah so after a wildfire fire, when that flower, when whispering bells, for example, is blooming, um, it grows for a while. It produces a whole bunch of seeds. 
the seeds get dropped and end up in the ground in the seed bank. They have the ability to just lie dormant there for as long as they need to. It can be for, I mean, since they're in habitats that it can go 60 to 100 years between fires, they can wait that long. Um, and what they're waiting for are the, um, we know for these plants in particular, for the nitrogen and smoke to penetrate the soil, and that tells them it's time to start growing again. So they know that there's been a fire, they grow up again after that fire when they know they're gonna have access to all of the light and water that they want. Um, and they start the cycle again. I know you talk about this a bit in the book, but can you touch upon how multiple fires without that um, kind of the, the healthy interval in between wildfires, what that does to the seed beds under the ground, those yeah, you know, seeds that have, are waiting there for the right time. If there's multiple fires, um, like in this case, you know, every five years, every two years, um, without that healthy break, then does that change the seed beds? So yeah, definitely. Um, it takes a certain amount of time for the, for the, for example, for these wildflowers to build up enough seeds to be waiting in the soil until after the next fire. And so if things burn again and they haven't had enough chance to get enough seeds in, into the ground, it's almost certainly not that they're not going to come up again in the future, but they might be, there might be a whole lot fewer of them. And if that cycle keeps happening where they just don't have enough time to get as many seeds back in, eventually they will start disappearing from the habitat. So these fires that were close together probably meant that there are fewer whispering bell seeds waiting in the canyon now, um, but I'm sure that they're not gone at this point. Linda asks, with 80% of fires humans started, that's Linda's number, not mine. I don't know if that's true. How can <laughs> ecosystems have healthy fire intervals? Um, so it might, I'm definitely not an expert or have the answers on this, but my, my understanding is that it's probably much less the, what is starting the fires that's the problem, but the conditions that then allow them to, <laughs> to burn um, over much greater areas in, and in a really uniform manner. So, it, I mean, absolutely human caused fires are a problem, but I don't think that that's probably the, 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 driving, the, the driving problem. Um, I mean, having, I mean, have, it, fires should happen and it, it is okay if they're human started, um, you know, it, unintentionally too, and, and that can still lead to a healthy fire. The problem really is if it is too dry um, and too hot, um, then the fire can burn. I mean, and really the biggest problem is if the fire burns in a really uniform manner over a, a great area. So what is especially important for healthy fire patterns is if when fires start, they burn differently in different areas as they move across the landscape so that you have areas where they burn very hot because that's good for some species and then burn much less hot in other areas and leave some areas unburnt so that you have these refuges for species to take shelter to then come back from to repopulate the rest of it and so i so my sense is it's much more important really the i mean the human caused problems for wildfire are much more because of the larger climate problems with with drought and um, heat and changing weather patterns Donna asks, what do you think about thinning, sometimes very vigorously, forests, and the thinking being that it will lessen fires and fire damage? Yeah, so that's a very, very, um, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly interesting topic that I, there's a lot of very different opinions about. Um, so one of, the, one of the problems with thinning is that it's really detrimental to remove um, dead trees from the landscape because dead trees and other dead um, plant material are still really, really important resources um, for the continuing life of that ecosystem. And so thinning does remove a whole lot of important, um, you know, nutrients and other resources. Uh, so there's, there's that reason that it's not good, but yeah, absolutely having huge amounts of dead and dry brush is going to increase fire intensity and, um, and the fire severity, so how much, how, you know, how much damage that fire actually does. And so probably there's some necessary balance of needing to do some thinning, but I do think it's very important to keep in mind that too much thinning is, is taking a lot of things out of the ecosystem that, that are still really important. And it's just very hard for, for us as humans to see how important that is because it just looks like a lot of dead stuff. 
Um, I guess Blaze has a follow up to that. And if if thinning or um, clearing forest floors is in in certain in a certain sense or in a certain scope appropriate is there a healthy interval um for this fire prevention technique yeah and i definitely don't have i don't have an answer to that i i probably <laughs> definitely not my area of expertise <laughs> um last question from deirdre she asks is it your experience that most animals escape the fire or at least attempt to i I can't speak from personal experience. I can speak more from the, um, you know, from the research that I've read. Um, I mean, it, it's the attempting to escape is a really interesting thing because absolutely there's large number of animals that are going to keep moving to stay away from the fire. Birds can fly away. Um, large mammals especially can run away and that is definitely happening. Um, what I found really interesting, though, is that that is not universal in any way. Um, there were trail cam cameras um, installed at Cold Canyon um, during the 2020 fires. And so you can see footage during the fires. You can tell that the fire is burning not that far away. And you can see deer wandering across the trail camera looking not looking concerned. <laughs> um, I think that there's a whole lot of understanding in wildlife of what is dangerous and what's not and what they can just sort of be moving around. And I, I think that our sort of human feeling of panic in any kind of fire is not something that we should assume that animals necessarily feel because they know a whole lot more about how fires burn and, and what's happening. And so Absolutely, they're going to try to stay away from the fire for the most part, but um, it's not necessarily this huge flight because they don't because they don't need to. Um, and then, of course, there are these um, plenty of insects and some birds that are going actively going to seek out fires, either still burning fires in the case of some of the insects or right after fires for for woodpeckers and, and other birds that are attracted to the insects. Um, Robin, thank you so much for joining us today and helping kind of shift our perspective um, on and our, you know, the relationship we have with fire. The Cold Canyon Fire Journals is out now, published by Heyday Books in Berkeley. Um, I will send everyone a link to that, a link to this interview, some other things we talked about today. Robin, I am so very grateful that you joined us um, and shared your wisdom and artwork with us. Thank you. Um, to everyone, next week, I am so excited to welcome another illustrator, Stanley Chow. He does all of our Alta headshots. He illustrates those. He is fantastic um, and a fascinating artist who will be zooming in from London. So I do hope you'll join us for that. August 23rd at 1230 here at Alta Live. Um, again, Robin, you're awesome and very talented. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Take care, everyone.